Um, without further ado, I welcome, welcome Jason Shen of RideJoy to the stage. So I'm Jason, and I co-founded a company called RideJoy, a long-distance community marketplace for ride-sharing. But before I was an entrepreneur, I was an athlete. I started doing gymnastics when I was six years old, and I spent a decade competing at the national level. This is a video of me in 2009, one of the last performances of my career on the parallel bars. You don't get to that level of performance by accident. By that time, I had spent well over 10,000 hours in training. I would pushed through you know, bad coaches, injuries, training plateaus, disastrous performances, you name it. But the greatest challenge of my athletic career actually came two and a half years earlier. I was at UC Berkeley, a junior at Stanford, and I was competing a newly learned double twisting vault. And this is the video that, um, there's a little bit of stuff. Oh! Ah! Yeah, uh, that's a textbook example of a total knee dislocation. They actually show that at the Stanford Medical School to students. Literally, it is a textbook example. I, d I tore all four ligaments in my knee, my ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. Uh, you know, my doctor, the team doctor, Daniel Garza, said to me, I'll be lucky if I'm running again, much less doing gymnastics. And, you know, if you thought that was bad, imagine my teammate who had to do that same vault right after me. <laughs> He almost chickened out, but he got it together, and he nailed it. So, um, you know, it took multiple reconstructive surgeries. They were putting in, you know, cadaver Achilles tendons into my knee, uh, months in crutches, uh, a year of intense physical therapy, but I did it. I came back a year later, and I was competing. I was only on the parallel bars and the pommel horse. And that year, we let the championship slip right through our fingers due to some mistakes made by folks that were uncharacteristic, including myself. I stayed a fifth year. Uh, I was elected a co-captain. And we worked hard. We got our mental preparation together. And we went and won a national championship, our first one in 14 years. So it was a big deal, and it was great. So two and a half years ago, when I started RideJoy with my two roommates and good friends, Calvin and Randy, I saw a lot of parallels between being an athlete and being an entrepreneur. We had our team of awesome people. We had a big vision, a big challenge ahead of us. And we were going to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Because I was taught that quit is a four-letter word and that you don't give up, you don't give in, and you do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's how it works. I did not expect that earlier this spring, we would be winding down operations at our startup, returning half of a $1.3 million seed round back to investors, and going on to work at other endeavors. This is what it's like to quit your startup. But first, here's a picture of me, Calvin, and Randy. Uh, we had just gotten off the phone with Paul Graham, and he had accepted us into the Y Combinator Summer of 2011 batch. I had never been more excited about any phone call in my life. Um, I didn't think they were, they were going to take us, because we had applied with one idea called Relove It. It was a sort of rediscover your social content from the past. And they said, look, we like you guys, but we don't really like your idea. Can you come and interview and just give us some new ideas? Uh, we said, OK, and we came up with some, something like the day before, and we pitched these customized photo printing books. 
Um, and they accepted us with a note that said, super enthusiastic founders, fund for the new idea, which was short for fund for the new idea that they will inevitably come up with at Y Combinator once they decide that this one is no good. <laughs> but I didn't find that out till a year later. That is actually their, their mechanism. So we got to Y Combinator and surprise, surprise, we decided to change our idea. And you know, the, the partners weren't surprised, they didn't put pressure on us, but with a 10-week program, the clock is ticking, we're putting pressure on ourselves. Those three weeks sitting in our apartment trying to come up with something new that we were gonna do were the longest three weeks of my life. But three weeks later, we had RideJoy, we, we settled on it, we said, we're done, this is it. Paul Graham said, uh, it's okay, why don't you come back and you know, keep thinking? And the next day we said, nope, this is it, we're doing this one. Uh, and seven weeks later, I'm standing in front of a room full of investors and showing a graph of users who had used our product to share rides to Burning Man that goes up and to the right and telling a story about how we were going to be the next great marketplace like eBay and Airbnb before us. So fast forward about 11 months, we raise our seed round. We hire some amazing people. We've got a team of six full-time plus two contractors. Uh, we've got tens of thousands of people using a service. We're growing at 25, 30% a month. And Calvin, Randy, and I would, would have these check-ins where we'd talk about the business and we'd sort of each say how we felt about how we were doing, how we thought the business was doing. And we sort of all did our check-ins. And I was like, okay, you know, we, we did our check-ins. And then my co-founder, Randy, looks at me and he says, okay, now, can we talk about how we're doing? And I was like, uh-oh. Um, and he's, you know, he's like a little, his voice is quavering. He's, you know, he's getting a little, you know, emotional. And he said to us, like, I've been feeling burned out for the past two months. And we had no idea. He, and it was, you know, he was working long hours. And we kept telling him, like, take, you know, you don't have to stay out so late every night. But he was doing it. But the other part was that he didn't think that the company was, was going in the right direction. Like it wasn't growing fast enough. Like we weren't gonna make it, it felt futile. It didn't feel like we were gonna hit a point where this was gonna be sustainable or this is gonna really work. And Calvin and I were, were trying to say, no, we, we're, we're on track, we can do this. Uh, but we didn't have anything really like concrete to, to try to convince him that this was gonna work. And so what we did is we went out and we talked to some of our investors and we talked to some people that we trust who would give us you know, honest feedback and we said, okay, we're growing 25, 30% a month now. What if we were growing like 50% a month? You know, what if we like 10 x our conversion rates on like passengers you know, get paying us through the system? What do you think about you know, in seven months we'd need a raise? Like, what do you think? What do you think? Do you think we could do this? Um, and the answers that we got were ranged from you're on the bottom end of maybe to there's no way, there's no way. Uh, but we're optimistic, so bottom end of May, like, okay, we could do this, you know, like, we've got our numbers, like, if we can hit this, you know, we've got a bottom end of maybe chance. Um, so the lesson there is, one, talk to your co-founders. If you're a single founder, make sure you have people, maybe it's your investors, maybe it's not your investors, that you are really, really being honest with, that you're talking about the things that scare the shit out of you. Because if you're not talking about them, then you are not making progress on the things that really matter for your business. Um, the second lesson is have those milestones that you really believe in. Sure, we had goals, we're gonna get to this, we're gonna hit this, but if you don't believe it, if you don't really think that it's critical, then they don't mean anything. You've got to find those numbers, whether it's revenue, whether it's new users, whether it's engagement, that you really believe you really have to hit because it means something significant for your business. So fast forward two more months, we launch our iPhone app. It's you know a super awesome product. We make it to um, top 25 app in the travel section of the App Store. We have Burning Man. We have all these people using our product. And we're kind of like, coming down from all this like press, all this stuff, all this excitement, and we get an email. And it's from the legal team at Craigslist, and it's a cease and desist. Um, for the you know, past period, we had developed two very transparent, very above board ways where we were acquiring new users, people were finding out about RideJoy through Craigslist, uh, along with lots of other startups that were doing this. Um, and then one day, Craigslist decided 
you know what, we're going to stop doing this. We're going to stop letting people sort of mooch off us like this and sort of blanket, um, you know, cease and desist were being sent. And we're pretty sure that it's during the press for all the iPhone app stuff that we got, we got like, you know, on their radar. So we talked to some of the other YC companies that had been affected and one of them talked to their lawyers and $10,000 later said that they had to comply and we said, okay, we probably have to comply. And because we had done that research before and said we need to hit these milestones, we need to grow at this rate, we knew that this was the way we were running the business now was not going to work. It could not work this way. This was 50% of our new user growth and we just lost our best distribution channel. So what are, you know, what are you gonna do now? So of course we told the team, we said, look, we knew this could happen one day and it's happened and it's in a bad spot, but we're gonna think about pivots. So we spent two weeks brainstorming related business ideas. We said, okay, what about, you know, a, doing Lyft or Sidecar? What about, you know, a parking app? What about, you know, a social travel community idea? And, you know, none of these ideas, did we feel like we had a competitive advantage? Did we feel like there's a good business opportunity? And you could tell that we hired a great team of people who were amazing, super competent, you know, just really great people. But this is not what they signed up for. When you apply to YC, you sign up for this kind of stuff. But they did not sign up for this. And we realized that if we were going to make, if this business was going to survive, we were going to have to, you know, make a dramatic change. And so we had to let go of our team, everyone that we hired. We moved back into our apartment after being in an office. Uh, this is it on Airbnb, so I promise you it looks way messier and way smaller than this. Uh, everyone who sees this is like, that's your apartment? <laughs> I've been there, it's not that big. Um, and we were back in sort of YC mode. Um, so the lessons there were, lessons three and four are, um, if you're building a marketplace, distribution is everything. I mean, we knew this and we knew we had to get off of Craigslist uh, but we couldn't. We tried press, we tried social media, we tried partnerships, we had dozens of events that we were doing rideshare with, all the, you know, we ran ads, we did all these things, nothing converted better, nothing scaled as well as Craigslist, and that is a problem. Uh, I know another YC company that's shutting down because they got, they were a marketplace and they got all their distribution from uh, Google, and then the Panda update happened, their rankings plummeted, and they ground for three months and got back, but they said, this is no way to run a business. If this is the only way you can get users and it's gonna change with the, on, on whim, you're in big trouble and they, so they shut down. Um, and so the lesson four is, you know, pivoting is not, into a related area is not always possible. You know, people talk, just pivot, just, you know, it's not that easy. And the people that you bring on may not be equipped to handle that. So, Let's see, oh, okay. So um, we spent the next six months um, coming up with new ideas and it was like going into the wilderness. We didn't, ha we didn't tell anyone, we told you know, YC, we told our investors that we were doing this, but the site was still up, we just turned off payments and then we just kind of let it run on its own and we were incubating, but now we didn't have a time frame that we had to deliver something at. And it was hard. We went to Mexico City to try to clear our heads. One of the investors wanted their money back. So they were like, you're just gonna shut down anyway. And we, we had to like fight to convince them that no, we, we have a plan, we can do this. Um, we, you know, but we just had so many, we couldn't get an idea that we all believed in. And part of that was uh, because, you know, if you've been, in, it's like being, you know, there's so many being in a relationship comparisons here, but it's like you break up with someone and the next day you're out there trying to date and trying to marry somebody. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to fall in love again, you know, and, and I think that we had that challenge. So the lessons to, to recap, have heart to heart with your co-founders, um, know what your major milestones are, distribution is everything when it comes to marketplaces, um, not everyone can think like an entrepreneur. Oh, the other thing, so number five here, what I felt that maybe we should have done is sort of shut down RideJoy, really publicly said, this isn't working, sorry guys, watch this space in 10 weeks, we are gonna come up with something new, watch it, and put the pressure on ourselves and run a new YC program. Now, you know, I've talked to my co-founders about this, we feel like may maybe there's a chance that that wouldn't have worked, like th that would have just ended us earlier, but 
I think that, that that putting that pressure on us would have been a healthy thing and it would have been the right thing to do given where we're at. And um, your values might change. I mean, I personally, you know, just speaking for myself, felt less interested in building something like we're gonna do, we're gonna change the world. It's gonna be ten years, but we're gonna like do it. I was like, I just want to do something successful, and it was so hard. But you know, that's what, just where we were at. Um, so you know, we talked a little bit about um, having a company acquire our team. But guess what? We couldn't find any companies that we all agreed we wanted to work at. Uh, and so we told our investors, look, I don't think this is going to work. They weren't thrilled. You know, no one wants to see this. But they understood. They appreciated that we weren't blowing their money. Um, and we were just, we were trying to do the right thing. We had been frugal. We had tried to preserve it so that we'd have the runway to do that next thing. And we realized there's no next thing. Seth Godin is one of my favorite business authors, and he's written a book a little while ago called The Dip. And The Dip is about the sort of hard work that happens a little bit after you start doing something where more effort does not sort of result in better outcomes, better results. And that uh, the, what most people do at that point is they quit. And that the people who become the best in the world are the ones that push through the dip and make it all the way to the other side, and then, and then there's, you know, they own that space. And with gymnastics, that injury, I knew. There was something on the other side. I knew we could win. We had been third, third, second. I knew we could win, and I wanted to come back and do that. But with RideJoy, when we lost the Craigslist, we knew that this was not going to be a venture-backed startup. Like, maybe this, in a couple years, this could be a small business, but is that really something that you want to do? And then, um, well, and, and Paul Graham calls the dip the trial of sorrow, which is another graph that you may have seen. But then when we were sort of in our six-month wilderness period, what we were really in was in a cul-de-sac, right, where more effort was not going to result in better outcomes because we just were going nowhere, right? You can run on a treadmill as hard as you want, and you're not going to go anywhere. And that's where we ended up. So, you know, I'm still really good friends with... All my co-founders, I'm really happy about that. Calvin is uh, doing product at a startup and thinking about what's next. Um, Randy moved to Beijing where he's learning Chinese and I moved to Washington DC to serve as a presidential innovation fellow. Um, but this is sort of where we came full circle. To come full circle all the way, I'll tell you, you know, about that time when I w was hurt. In 2007, when I had my knee injury, I didn't have to go to the gym every single day for four hours the way I was, and I had a little bit of free time. There was some space that had opened up in my life. And I got involved with a couple students who ended up starting a nonprofit called Gumball Capital. And that is where I first met Calvin, uh, my future roommate and co-founder. And this is what got me into entrepreneurship in the first place. I was a biology major, and this is what turned me on to that. And what you know, I want to leave you with is this idea that um, you know, quitting sucks. I'm not into giving up. That is not what I'm about. But sometimes you have to make room in your life to have something amazing be there. And so that's, that's our story. Thanks. Uh, just a possibly naive question. Was there any discussion about um, sharing revenue with Craigslist for uh, conversions or something like that in order to keep the channel open? That's not something they were interested in. I mean, Craigslist only makes money from two places, jobs and housing. And they didn't even make money on the rideshare section at all. And we weren't making any money from the rideshare section. So not really an option. Okay, but good you. question. When you got to that point, oh, when you got to the point where 
you're just telling us about your experiences. And I'm like, no, don't quit, you know, like, just keep on going. And then the last thing you said about, like, you know, sometimes you have to create, like, give yourself the space to have something else, like, awesome come in was kind of where I was like, oh, you know, the whole time I'm, like, judging. And, like, and then I was like, oh. <laughs> Derek <laughs> Sivers, um, who started CD Baby, has this blog post where he says, it's either hell yeah or no. And it's the idea is that if you can't say hell yeah to what you're doing, or this meeting, this idea, this project, this startup, then it's a no. And I think that's you know part of that idea, mentality. Like poker. In terms of my company or just? Um, I think I think one thing that often happens is people ask, you know, how much mentorship did you get? How much sort of advice are you getting from the partners? And uh, I think we had a few partners that we really relied on. But what I learned, or you know, maybe what I was surprised to learn is that uh, I learned so much from our peer groups, our batch mates. I still keep in touch with them regularly, and there's so much trust there. And there's so much sort of honesty there, sort of these kinds of conversations, but even more in depth. And that's what sort of I learned the most from. And so that's maybe something that's not really emphasized in sort of when people are thinking about like what YC offers. I think it's very significant. Is is the sorry, <laughs> um, is the Presidential Innovation Fellowship what you consider like amazing that's going to be in your life, or do you still see yourself going back and working with Randy and Calvin to create something amazing for the world? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I kind of applied to uh, the fellowship on a whim, thinking there's probably no chance that I'm going to get this, but it seems so different and so cool that I, I should try. Uh, it has been pretty amazing because I would never otherwise have the chance to uh, work in federal government at such a high level, you know, sitting in meetings where they're talking about sort of policy and working at, the, I, my specific project is at the Smithsonian, and my boss literally reports to the secretary of the Smithsonian, so the, the kind of experiences that I've had there, um, <laughs> Smithsonian's mo motto is like, seriously amazing, um, and, and it has been. But, you know, that's, that's sort of winding down in the next two months and sort of thinking about what's next is, is more of a process than anything else. And uh, in terms of working with Calvin and Randy, I think we're going to stay friends, but I don't think we're going to jump into another startup together anytime soon. Thanks. Thanks.